Ole Zavassian and thank you for tuning in. Well, last week we took you through a kaleidoscope of music across three different regions in ASEAN. This week we'll take you through three more. We start off with Myanmar, a country that's undergoing some pretty rapid development recently. And we promise you, this episode is bound to take your breath away, literally. Instead of blowing through a flute from the mouth, this art uses the nostrils and it holds close significance to the chins, which are among the 100 races living in Myanmar, residing in the western mountain ranges. So follow our local host and be mesmerized with this well-preserved tribal musical instrument called the, the nose, nose flute. flute. Today, we take a great pride in presenting this program on one traditional music instrument, which is a flute to be played by nose. The Chins are among the over 130 national races of Myanmar, residing along the steep western mountain ranges of the country. If you are together with them, you can experience their simplicity and hospitality. The flute to be played by nose is being performed by Thai people, the ethnic minorities of Chin national races. They have preserved this knowledge of playing since the time of their ancestors and have handed down from generation to generation. When I started learning how to play the flute by nose, I was about 18 years old or 19 years old. At the time, my parents were still alive. An old man who lived next to our home was always playing at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock every early morning. I was attracted by the melody released from the flute. That sounded really pleasing me, so I went to him and requested him to teach me. When he agreed, he started teaching me the way to play the flute. I followed whatever he taught me at that time. When we started learning, he taught me to play the short flute. While I kept on learning from the old man, when I could produce a sound, he gave me his flute. Then he ordered me to keep up the knowledge of playing before he passed away. I still remember his words. I maintain the flute well and value it like my own life. There is no more who can make such a flute. My mentor told me that the one who will make such a flute must have the skills of singing and know well about the maestries of ancestors. Such a person can make a flute. The better he can sing, the better the sound will be. He said, there has to be a certain time to make such a flute. We cannot make whenever we want to. The time when the crops become mature is the best occasion to make it. I cannot remember the exact time. Besides him, there is only a few chins who can play the flute by nose in this remote little town. This handful of flute players constitute just a minority compared to the population of over 45,000 in Minde. Moreover, most players are elderly persons of over 60 years. This shows that there may not be anyone from the new generation wanting to take over this cultural inheritance and preserve it. Last time, a 10-member youth came to me and requested me to teach. It didn't even last a week. They give up as they cannot play to make sounds. No one is willing to learn like me. I found out 
that you must have a strong will to do so. Sometimes I think that, after I pass away, my flute will be gone too. I feel so sad for it. Although my mantle could hand it down to me, I have no more inheritors. Hence, this way of playing such a flute will disappear completely from the earth. Our player Uhomana is worried about the flute to be played by nose as there is no one that he can hand over to. This in turn might make him feel that he is not dutiful. We can all understand his feelings. So is it unique knowledge of playing the flute going to disappear completely from our planet after him and all the players have gone? And what about the new generations? Don't they value such melodies? Now is the crucial period with regard to the playing of the flute by nose. We now travel to the Philippines with our host Jules Guyang to have a closer look at an indigenous musical piece called the Kubing. It is made from bamboo and it's a type of a jaw harp and the sound it produces is based on the different movements of the tongue. But when it is played, you will know it is the Kubing. It is now taught in schools and institutions to ensure that this musical instrument stays in the generations for many more years to come. This is a retired music professor from the Premier University of the Philippines. A native of Kalinga Province, Mr. Benicio Sokong, popularly known as Mang Beni. Among his advocacies is to promote the use of indigenous musical instruments and impart the Kalinga music not only to his countrymen but also to the world. 25 years ago, Mang Beni started crafting musical instruments mostly from bamboo. One of these is the kubing. Ito ang bayog, itong klase ng kawayan. At pag biniyak-biyak mo yan at nagkakaroon ng maraming strip, kumuha ka na lang mga strip ganito. Pag nakagawa ka ng ganitong islat, ay dyan ka na magsisimulang gumawa. Kagaya ng design na ito, ay yung... yung... buho na tinadatadtad mo at nilaga mo. Yun ang walling ng bahay. Yun ang nakadipik dito. Tapos ito naman, yung, yung balat ng ahas. Ito naman yung mga designs sa mga tapis at saka bahag. While the kubing is called different names, one thing is common. It produces an exceptional and distinct sound. This can be found throughout the Philippines. For several tribes in the south, it is called kubing. In the central Philippines, it is known as subing. While in the northern Luzon, it is labeled as ulibao. Other countries in the ASEAN region also have their own versions of kubing. Like Mang Benny, Professor Ed Drew is also an expert in playing the kubing. Ito yung kubing eksakto. Yan ang tawag ng maranao sa ganitong uri ng instrument. Nakutawagin sa English ay mouth harp or jews harp or jaws harp. Itong particular na ito ay kubing ng mga maranao. Napapansin natin na mababa ang uh, tono. May taal na tunog, pero kung gagalaw-galawin mo ang dila, maraming napapabago. Itong isa naman ay sa katimugan na naman. Ang instrumentong ito ay kung tawagin ay kombing naman ng mga tiboli. 
Kuribao na mga ibanag at itawit sa probinsya ng Cagayan. Pwede kang tumugtog ng uh, uh, broken chords, halimbawa, or scale. Or, yung diatonic scale kung tawagin. The group is also known for its expertise in integrating indigenous musical instruments with the contemporary in order to produce a new music for the new generation. Though the kubing is widely used by various tribes, especially in their festivities, it is evident that many of the urban residents, particularly the youth, are unfamiliar with this instrument. This is among the reasons why the Bale Balayan was formed, a museum for the poor and a center for transformation through the arts. Volunteers of the organization teach students how to play local and Asian-inspired musical instruments free of charge. Training ng mga bata dito ay araw-araw. Pero hindi lang sa musika ang pinag-aaralan nila, nag-aaral din sila sa pagbabasa at pagsusulat. Among its enthusiastic students are Shekaina and Julius. Katapos po na mag-school, pupunta po kami dito. Tapos po, tuturuan po kami mag-alugtog at saka po mag-ulintang. Sinali po nila ako kasi sabi po daw nila, Masarap daw po tumugtog. Both of them are optimistic that they will become musicians in the future. Araw-arawin ko po ang kapapractice para lalo ako matuto. Imbis na tumambay po kayo at sumali na lang po kayo sa balay-balay, marami pa po kayong matututunan. Nakikita ko naman sa kalan lagi enjoy sila. Kahit na medyo mahirap siyang gamitin, ang mga bata ay pinipilit nila itong um, tugtugin. Naniniwala ang mga anak balibalayan na ang musika o at ang ating mga instrumento, ito ay ang ating kaluluwa. Kaya kahit kailan, hindi ito pwedeng mawala sa atin. For these kids, music is their future. But for Mang Benny, music is also a living. Oo, oh, kung sa kabuhayan eh, nakakatulong to kasi pag may mga nagawa ka, bebente mo rin. So, May meron kang pambili ng pangangailangan sa bahay, pangangailangan sa isklan, mga, mga bata na nag -aaral. However, he ensures that his instruments are well utilized. At hindi ako nagbibigay sa mga commercial uh, stores dahil sayang lang yung pagod mo pag napupunta sa commercial. Nagagawa lang na na Pangarte-arte lang sa bahay o kaya kung, eh, dahil uh, nasasayangan ako kung na, nasa commercial sa kasi gawa mo ng uh, pinamagan, pi, pinaganda mo yung tunog. Just like other indigenous musical instruments, if not taken care of, the kubing may face extinction. Thus, full support for our makers of these instruments and appreciation for its players are necessary. Sa unang-una pa lang, dapat, dapat ito ay mapapalago sa mga una sa mga gumagawa. Turuan sila kung paano gumawa at para kung tayo yung mga matatanda na at uh, wala na dito sa ibabaw ng lupa, ay meron pang magpapatuloy na mga tao para hindi mamatay itong ating kultura. Kaya kailangan may magtuturo, paano i-appreciate ito, tsaka maturuan yung mga, mga, mga kabataan na gagawa. Malagang tangkalikin natin ito kasi kung sa ating mga Pilipino, ito'y ating identity. Ito'y katutubong instrumento natin. 
hindi lang sa Cordillera, kundi sa South, buong Pilipinas. At kung sa level ng musika ay pwede mo itong tugtugin sa sarili mong tugtog o yung ibig sabihin sa traditional at saka sa, sa mainstream music. we take you to one of the most busiest city centers in the region, Singapore. Amidst the hustle and bustle of city life, there still exists a longing to live alongside culture, tradition, and music. Follow Ebi Shankra as we take you into the lives of three young Singaporeans, this younger generation that's representing a desire and even a hunger to live with the culture and tradition they represent. The Indian with his sitar, the Chinese, the Erhu, and the Malay, the Gundang. These three youngsters are not just the only voices we'll be hearing. We'll also hear from academician Dr. Larry Francis Hilarion as he lends his thoughts into the trends and direction of music in a city like Singapore. Welcome to Singapore a melting pot of cultures brought in by the early migrants who hailed from different parts of the world. They brought with them musical instruments to accompany to soothe their homesickness. The music from these different groups of migrants today has become the folk tradition or traditional music. Meet Ridwan, a pioneer in body percussion. Malay by ethnic group, his love for gandang or the drums have brought him to perform all over the world, representing Singapore in many cultural festivals. I was first introduced to drums and percussion when I was seven years old by my uncle in traditional Malay music setting. And then as I grow, um, I became engrossed with the entire world drums and percussion. I took it to the next level, I joined the Cell College of the Arts. That's when I got my formal education in music. The reason behind my choice of playing percussion and drums was because I believe that these instruments are a gift of joy and love and hope. Um, unlike any other instrument, the drums are the instrument that doesn't make anyone um, feel sad and depressed. That's why drums will always be close to my heart. I love music so much, the reason is, it's a way of life for me. It's not any hobby or um, work. For me, it's the way I lead my life. And music is a universal language of the world. Meet Krishna. When he was 10, most boys would choose a guitar, but he picked up the Indian instrument sitar instead. He is also the first non-Indian to win the 2002 National Indian Music Competition. So I grew up in a family of musicians, and at five, my dad decided to teach me the sitar. And so ever since to me, family and music, they are the same thing. So the interest really came about when I realised that what my father has given to me was something great. It was when I was 12 years old and I won the competition. And from then on, my interest climbed and I want to reach and seek a different height of playing and skill levels. So people do ask me sometimes, is it difficult for you for a Chinese guy playing the sitar. And I'll be like, yes, it is to a certain extent difficult because I do not grow up listening to Indian music. But then again, the irony is when I was five, I started, so that's when I started listening to Indian music. So is it difficult or is it not difficult? You know, To me, at this current point, music is not difficult. Learning any instrument is not difficult. 
What's difficult is when you choose to make it difficult. Music at the end of the day means love, family, who wouldn't enjoy doing what they love most with their own family. Dr. Larry, could you tell us uh, more about the sitar? The sitar is symbolic of North Indian music and it's a lute instrument, plucked lute. The sitar's significance, characteristic, it encompasses or encapsulates the whole idea of Indian music. It has the melody, played the lead melody, it has the rhythm, Rhythmic articulation in sitar playing is very complex. It has the drone, which acts as like a harmony, and improvisation is so important. All these four musical elements shape Indian music, and the sitar is representative of all these four elements. I think it's fascinating. <laughs> His interest in music started when he was nine years old. Since 2009, he, together with the Singapore National Youth Chinese Orchestra, have been representing Singapore at various international music festivals. When I was young, I always had an interest in music. So when it's time to choose a co-curricular activity in the primary school, I decided to learn the Erhu in the Chinese orchestra. Because at the time, I already been learning the organ, which is a Western instrument, and I would like to try something totally new. Initially, when I learned the Erhu, I thought it is an easy instrument to pick up because it has only two strings. But I was wrong. Unlike the violin, the Erhu do not have a fingerboard. Therefore, intonation is a challenge for us. If we apply too much pressure onto the string, the pitch will be a bit higher. So this is something that is very unique to the Erhu, which, is, which we need to overcome it. To me, music is a form of expression and it's also an international language. As a music teacher, I use music to interact with my students, enabling them to express themselves creatively and confidently. The Erhu is one of the most important ancient Chinese instruments. It is called the Chinese violin. It can imitate sounds from a chirping bird to a neighing horse. It was brought down to Singapore by our early Chinese immigrants. So, Dr. Larry, could you tell us more about the Erhu? Yes, certainly. The Erhu simply means two strings. The Erhu has tremendous amount of characteristic. It can play almost like the sitar. Uh, improvisation is uh, very pronounced. The control of dynamics, the portamento, the ornamentation, these are so interesting because there's almost, one is a plucked sitar lute, the other one is a bowed lute, which has almost similar characteristic. And the blend, I think, will be very interesting to see how it turns out in fusion music. I've got a challenge for the three of you. Okay, come on, bring it on, man. Okay. I know all three of you are very good in your individual instruments, but can you join forces to perform a song? Oh, that's easy. That's easy, no? That's not all. I am going to give you the folk song, and you've got to make it uniquely Singapore. Okay? okay? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> okay. okay? Well, this is going to be interesting. I think we're in for a surprise. Hey, hey, hey. What's the song? Ah? I think it's important to preserve our heritage because it's a responsibility. As it's been around for so many years, so we shouldn't let it die off and to carry and pass it on. But at the same time, we, couldn't, we shouldn't just like pass it on. We should try to innovate, improve on it, um, create more expression, more ideas, and we pass it on. So that um, the future generation have more to, to, to learn from there. The best thing about her our heritage is if we are able to harness it through our work works, our composition, uh, and I think it will hopefully resonate with the entire community who listen and watch. We can do something slightly rockish with the Indian sitar vibe or we can actually try to mimic certain things but leaving the, still, still leaving its um, original flavour and its texture on it. So I think that's the only way we can make it really relevant in the easiest 
in, in the easiest way. Guys, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. You have elevated the level for the next generation of Singaporeans. We have called a very experienced uh, performer here in Mr. Trevor Nerva and two very beautiful dancers to partake in this performance. So before we go into the performance, thank you so much. I am Abhi Shankara. Thank you for joining us in this segment of Colors of ASEAN 2. I will not hold you back much longer. One, two. Done some pretty cool things in this episode. We've played the flute with our nostrils, we've seen an instrument called the jawbone harp in action, and also taking a look at how a city like Singapore, with all its fast forwardness, is still keeping check of culture and tradition within its communities. And it's great to see a higher sense of appreciation and awareness from the younger generations to ensure that all these instruments stay for many, many years. So next week, we're going to go to Brunei, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand, and we're going to check out more great instruments from all these countries. So until then, I'm Zela Ismail. And I'm Terence Das. See you soon on Colors of ASEAN.